Good morning, Southside. Good, Good to see you here that are in the auditorium. And welcome also those that are watching us online. The service at Southside Church of Christ this morning. For those in the auditorium, please check to see that your cell phones are turned to silence. If you're a guest, please fill out a card in front of you, if you haven't before, in the pew, and put it in the offering plate as you leave today's service. We're called together on the first day of the week, as was done in the first century, to worship our God. I'd like to read this morning from, and I'll move here, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Let us sing praises to our God. It is convenient to stand with you. Come, let us all unite to sing God is love. Let heaven and earth this praises bring God is love. Let every soul from sin awake, each in his heart sweet music make, and sing with us for Jesus' sake. Our God is love. 
Good morning. morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, we are immensely thankful that we have you as our God. You are understanding of our shortcomings, know that we are flawed and prone to sin, and yet you are there for us. We're very thankful and feel very blessed to live in a country where we can practice religion as we, as we choose and as you direct. We are in troubling times when we ask that you look down upon us and our national and local leaders, health professionals, first responders, and those dealing with this COVID crisis. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together this morning to worship in person and remotely we're, we're available. So as we continue our worship service, we ask that you look down upon us and know that we are grateful and again, very thankful for all that you've done, especially through your, the gift of your son's death and resurrection, which gave us salvation. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound the trumpet to me no more, and the Lord embrace eternal bright and fair. When the sailors shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the few weeks we've used Acts 24 as a framework for what we've done where Paul was in chains before Felix under arrest but he preached and his message included faith in Christ Jesus righteousness self-control the judgment to come and those are the things we've kind of centered our messages on but also it's important to remember that that Paul was addressing all of these things in a world that was plural a world that was confused and so I came across this. This may be a little hot there, Mike. If you want to turn it down just a little. Warning, mass confusion ahead. Uh, I don't know. I thought about just leaving this up for the whole sermon, but that pretty well describes our world, doesn't it? Just mass confusion. And uh, people are confused, and people have all kinds of ideas, and it is a confusing time. 
And unfortunately, the general reaction to all this chaos, all this confusion, is not to ask questions and try to find clarity, but to get angry. And a lot of people are angry to the point that they tolerate no one disagreeing with them on anything. And social media has given a great big platform to express anger and hatred. And anyone in the country can, can put their anger out there at literally the touch of a button. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians have gotten caught up in this. And I thought about reading a few Christian posts this morning, but not really a good idea. And for us as followers of Jesus, it's important to look at how he expressed his anger. And last week, we talked about the fact that Jesus did get angry in his ministry. But we also talked about who he got angry at. And basically, when you go through and read the scriptures, he got angry at religious people. He was angry at those who placed their religion and themselves above others, who even used their religion to justify hatred and ignoring a lost world. But to that lost and hurting world, Jesus responded differently. And there's, oh, we could just go through the Gospels and talk about so many places. You could talk about the woman at the well, who uh, her life was a wreck. But yet Jesus came to her, singled her out, and told her about living water. We could talk about the woman caught in adultery. The Jews wanted to condemn her, but Jesus said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. We've talked about this each week. Jesus weeping over Jerusalem because the people were lost. And at the cross, it's Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And the anger in our world, the anger that we see in so many, sometimes maybe even in us, is not what drove Jesus. James chapter 1 and verse 20 says, The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And while Jesus no doubt felt frustration at the world, like I said, he even wept over it, he didn't rail against it in anger and hatred. He came to bring salvation. And he expects us to tell the world about this salvation that he gives to everyone who will come to him. And once again, we talk about self-control and righteousness. We are under Christ's control, the power of Christ. It's just like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.14. Last week we talked about that the love of Christ controls us. And earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says, We have the mind of Christ. That's what controls us. And this morning, I'm going to refer heavily. I'm going to read several sections uh, out of a book I know you're familiar with because I've talked about it a lot. And that's the book Saving Truth by Abdu Murray. I've mentioned it for the last couple of years at numerous occasions. Uh, and uh, we're doing this book on our Sunday night life group. And he has some of the best material on what's happening in our world, how we respond to it, how can we understand. And it's just tremendous. And so I will be relying heavily on some of his material and reading at length some of his stuff because he can say it better than I can. But there's also another book I would recommend. It's called The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race, and Identity by Douglas Murray. And it's value because he's not a Christian. In fact, he declares himself to be an atheist. But it's a good book to read because we need to understand it's not just Christians who are upset about some of the things happening in our world and concerned about it. He is too. Because logically, there are reasons for dealing with some of these things. So those are just a couple of things that I recommend. And if you need to get these titles again, let me know. Uh, and I can get them to you. But here's where I want to begin this morning. Every human, every human being is made in the image of God. One of the grandest statements in all of Scripture is John chapter 1, verses 26, or John, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We are made in the image of God. Which means there is something special about us, about all humans. And it also means that that image can only be expressed in our relationship with God. Mankind, all of us, humanity was not created to live apart from God. But Satan does everything he can do to disrupt that relationship with God. And what Satan tries to do, he tries to get us to deny God's place in creation as creator and our place in creation as 
those created. Satan's greatest temptation in Genesis was for the man and the woman to declare themselves to be God and to move outside of relationship with Him. And this ultimately is the root of all sin in our world. And as Abdul Murray says in his book Saving Truths, is we live in a post-truth world. People may say there is truth, but it doesn't mean anything. They've been taught to believe that personal preference and desires are all that matter. People, as Murray points out, says they really don't want freedom. What they want is autonomy. The right to do and be anything they want with no boundaries. And in his book he says, through unfettered autonomy, we make ourselves into gods who are accountable to no one. And then we use our divinity to declare that we are less than human. Perhaps confusion is too mild a word to describe our culture. Our culture has done what Israel did in the Old Testament in the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, there was horrible sin in the land. And the reason for this, this sin is expressed in the very last verse of the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That describes our post-truth world. And one of the biggest issues of confusion we're looking at today is the gender issue. And I'm going to address it for a few minutes, just touching on some, there's so much material out there, I'm just going to touch on it, but also, you know, make sure we're clear on the issue, but how do we approach it? That's what we want to talk about for just a few minutes. And you know, a few years ago, we would never have dreamed that gender could be so confusing. You know, we're either male or female. Just like I read, that's the biblical view. God created them male and female. But what has been very straightforward and fairly simple has now become one of our greatest areas of confusion. There's the whole transgender issue, which includes a host of terms we won't get into. But basically, here's, here's what it's about. The whole gender issue rests on the idea that a person can identify as whatever sex they want, regardless of their anatomy. And we need to be clear as we start. There are some people who have real problems with body confusion. And there are medical people involved in dealing with that. And it's considered a medical condition. Theologian John Milbank, however, he, he says it well. He says, but many people rightly sense that the liberal obsession with the transgender issue has gone beyond merely wanting to help this minority. It has become a whole movement to change our notions of gender. And its preoccupations come across as irrelevant to most people, unjustified in its conclusions, and apparently condemnatory of the normal with which most people identify. He goes on to say, says, the contemporary liberal worldview divides the mere fact of given bodily sex from the chosen cultural construction of gender. Here's what he means. He says, appearances are nothing more than meaningless physical circumstances. Real gender is seen as something that our culture has collectively fantasized. The International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission says it this way. I've got some things just to share. He says, they say, for other sexualities to be possible, it is indispensable and urgent that we stop governing ourselves by the absurd notion that only two possible body types exist, male and female. No, they call it absurd. With only two genders inextricably linked to them, man and woman. We make trans and intersex issues our priority because their presence, activism, and theoretical contribution show us the path to a new paradigm with, that will allow as many bodies, sexualities, and identities to exist as those living in the world might wish to have, with each one of them respected, desired, and celebrated. All right. The bottom line there's no such thing as men and women. We choose what we want to be. And it's gotten to the point that a person is even heroic if they're confused about their identity. I'll read again. Here's some material by Murray. He says, but the hero heroicism ascribed to being gay or sexually confused makes these identities morally attractive. Instead of being just expressions of one's sexuality, they are seen as expressions of one's virtue. The same tends to be true about gender identity. People who deal with gender dysphoria, the pervasive feeling that one's gender doesn't match their biological sex, are engaged in a genuine and often painful struggle. 
Those who eventually choose to identify with a gender different from their anatomy are lauded and as headline-making heroes. When Bruce Jenner became Caitlyn Jenner, ESPN awarded him the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage. It's interesting that those who resolve their dysphoria by sticking with their bodily sex never make the headlines. And just a note here. My nose is bothering a little. Even though people may want to believe that we are genderless, doctors and other medical people as a whole won't go that route, at least when it comes to medical treatments. I went to, to a, a pharmacist here, uh, the pharmacy here a few weeks ago and got pneumonia shot. And of course they give you the paperwork to fill out. And uh, there's, there's the name, you know, write your name, uh, last name, first name. And then there was on the next line or two boxes, male or female. There was not a box that you could check other. Medical treatment realizes that there is only male and female. They are not interchangeable. A person can call themselves whatever they want, but it becomes totally irrelevant when it comes to going to a hospital or the doctor. But the real issue for us is how do we respond to this confusion? And again, a lot of Christians have responded by railing in anger against the world and saying all kinds of things. And a lot of people express total disgust and outrage at this sin. But God shows us a better way to respond. And it goes back to Genesis 1. We're made in the image of God, male and female. And again, with gender confusion, some are claiming that, claiming that there's no such thing as male or female. But since there's no gender at all, the only thing left is self. And as John Milbank says, the lone self, which God never intended. We were created to live in a relationship with God and with one another. We're not created to live. We were not created to live in a genderless world. And this type of thinking, it's the result of our fallen nature, trying to live apart from God. Our freedom can only be found in God, in being what we were created to be and respecting God's boundaries. Murray gives a great example, illustration in his book. And he says, this illustration may help. He says, my family enjoys the blessing of a big backyard, but that yard abuts a major road. Now, when the kids were younger, my wife and I set boundaries beyond which the kids could not go. Without those boundaries, we would have been worried that a ball might bounce into the road and the kids being inattentive as they were might have chased the ball into the traffic. The boundaries protected not only their safety, but also their freedom. Without those boundaries, our kids wouldn't have had the freedom to enjoy the yard for its intended purpose. Now, that's a great illustration. Unfortunately, however, many people have bought into the idea that freedom means being free from any restrictions at all. There are no boundaries. And as Murray says, that isn't real freedom. If what we want to be doesn't line up with the reality of what we are, we may remove social boundaries just as we might free a tiger from his cage, but we can be no more free of our nature as humans, male or female, than we can a tiger from his stripes or a camel from his hump. Unbounded freedom may sound like a great idea. It may sound liberating on the surface, but in reality, the unbounded freedom people want so badly is one of the most powerful enslaving things there is. As Jesus said in John 8, 34, truly, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. No matter how badly people want to remove the boundaries God has given us, reality will provide limits. The boundaries can't be removed without disastrous consequences. Just like Murray's illustration, if he'd removed those boundaries, it would have been disastrous for his children. And here's the, here's the point we need to look at. The boundaries on being human and human sexuality, they're not, they, God didn't choose them arbitrarily. God is not trying to, to deny some freedom, restrict, restrict some freedom, but what he's trying to do is protect something sacred and beautiful. And Murray has a great chapter in his book that deals with this whole subject. A chapter entitled, Clarity About Sexuality, Gender, and Identity. It's chapter 6 in the book. And here's the way he begins. He says, She walked to the microphone, timid yet determined. 
The question that struggled to free itself from her lips had nothing to do with the evening's topic, yet it couldn't have been more relevant. That night I joined two colleagues for a university open forum during which we addressed religious pluralism. Stammering a bit through her question, the young lady said, well, sorry if this is, is off topic, but um, I've searched for answers and I can't seem to find any, so I thought I'd come tonight and ask you guys, where does Christianity, if it does at all, differ on homosexuality as opposed to other religions, and if so, how? The silence of a church on Monday morning momentarily filled the auditorium. <laughs> Everyone wondered what was going to come out of my mouth next, including me to some extent. <laughs> I was sure of my position on the matter, but I was unsure of how I would convey it. What will I say that will not compromise biblical sexuality, yet show the student that God cares for her beyond measure? See, what he wanted to do, he wanted to make his answer godly. He wanted to be like Jesus. He wanted to be filled with compassion, giving hope, picturing a God who loves His creation beyond measure, not a God who is impressive, uh, oppressive and hateful. And there are some things we need to be clear on as we talk about this sin. Sometimes when we deal with certain sins, we see others as more broken than we are. Paul in Romans 3, he reminds us, we talked about this a lot. All have sinned and fall short of the, of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And in Romans 6, Paul says, And the wages of sin is death. And the only hope we have is the free gift of Jesus. All humanity is broken by sin. All of us, all people, we all need the same thing. A Savior. We all stand before God as sinners. Falling short of the holiness that God is. And to see others as somehow worse than ourselves, it's, it's to deny the transforming power of the cross and the gospel in our lives and to deny the transforming power of the cross and the gospel in the lives of other people. As Murray says, we dare not judge other people's value to God. And in Murray's answer to the young lady that night at the open forum, he explained to her that God, the gospel has a better answer. Again, God is not arbitrarily restricting His creation. He is, he is uh, uh, protecting His creation. When it comes to marriage and sexuality, God is protecting something sacred and beautiful, what He has designed. In Romans 1, 24-27, Paul writes that, that, that homosexuality has moved outside of the opposite sex intention that God, that God created. Homosexuality is outside of God's design. And Paul says more about this in 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 9-11, where he lists a host of sins that will keep people from inheriting the kingdom of God. And, and this includes sexual sins, homosexual sins. But Paul also goes on to say in verse 11, he says, And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. The people Paul was writing to had found their true identity in Jesus. They had been washed, sanctified, and justified. And as Murray says, the boundaries God has placed on sexuality are there to protect its sacredness and in turn, our sacredness. He says, human sac sacredness leads us to see why human sexuality is sacred and worth protecting. When we fawn over a baby, we're not coldly observing a mere organism. We're beholding the cheek-dominated visage of one who bears divine fingerprints. Sex between a man and a woman is the only means by which such a precious being comes into this world. And because a human being is the sacred product of sex, the sexual process by which that person is made is also sacred. And what I want to do is just play a short clip. Uh, not only do we have the book, uh, uh, Saving Truth, there's a DVD, DVD series we've been going through. And I'd like for you to just watch about three minutes long. Part of the explanation he gave that young lady that night, it's, I think, some excellent thoughts. And I'd like to just look at that for just a minute. Oh, the bond of marriage is a picture of the sacredness of unity and diversity as well. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 says that a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
Jesus says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. You see, the two genders aren't interchangeable. That's what's important here. Jesus actually makes the point, he says, he created them in his own image. The Bible says he created them, male and female, in his own image. There's something about being female in and of itself that bears God's image. There's something about being male in and of itself that bears God's image. Men are vital to marriage because of their maleness. Women are vital to marriage because of their femaleness. Both are valuable. Men and women are emotionally and mentally diverse. If you don't know that, just get married and you'll find out. But there's a complementariness to their diversity. Now, as a culture, we love unity and diversity. We push for diversity in television programming. We push for it in company hiring and all these things. We have entire diversity committees. Why do we love diversity so much? Because the one who made us is a unity of diversities. The Trinity is a definition of unity in diversities in relationship. One God with three minds, independent of each other, who interact in that sense of relationship. He is the cause, we are the effect. We want unity and diversity because God is the origin of unity and diversity. That's why it's so important that we reflect it. God gives us the ability through marriage, actually gives us the gift through marriage, to reflect the divine. When a man and a woman, who are both diverse, come together, they are, what the Bible says, one. The word in Hebrew is not numerically one, it's echad, which means unified. The two are unified, the unity of diversities. That's what God is like, and we get to reflect that. And there's one more aspect to it. The fact of the matter is, is that at the end of the world, there is the judgment, but there's also the great wedding, where unity and diversity happens again. God, who's timeless, who is pure, who is sinless, who is all knowing and all powerful, marries himself to a once very, very temple, very, very dirty, very, very simple creation, who he washes white as snow, and he marries them to himself. We are to reflect the divine in our marriages and our sexuality here, because ultimately all of us, whether we have sanctus attractions or not, are going to experience that unity diversity if we put our trust in Christ, follow what he says for sexuality. He had some profound things to share there. And if you uh, look at all the material he presented on the DVD, he says as, as after he answered that young lady, she had tears streaming down her face. She had never heard this. What a wonderful picture about the sacredness of, of, of what this is all about. And that God's design is something he is protecting, something we need to protect and recognize. And also something we need, this image is what we need to present to the world. Because it comes back to this whole idea of being made in the image of God, Genesis 1. We're made in the image of God, but we are fallen. That's Genesis 3. Sin, all sin, is a perversion of the good that God has blessed humanity with. You know, C.S. Lewis made a statement. He said, good is able to exist on its own, while evil requires the good on which it is parasitic. That's quite a statement. And what he's saying is that good is original, it's from God. Evil is a perversion of the good. And God is calling us back to the good that he created us to be. Restoring us to made in his image. And it is through the cross that God does this. Our hope comes only through Jesus. The word became flesh who dwelt among us. He's the one who came and truly revealed God. And Jesus' walk with us, while He walked with us, He ultimately went to the cross. And that's where we see just how deep our sin is, all of us. We see what it cost God to redeem us from sin. And as God's people, we need to have this picture of love and compassion that God has, not only for us, but for the whole world. Our world right now needs hope. Now, not everyone will listen. 
But we serve and teach in our world because there are those who are looking. And I think it's one passage that tells us how we need to talk to our world. It's Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Paul says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We are a people, the world needs to see hope in us. And we need to teach them that they can have the same hope, the salvation. And we need to present the beauty of the male and female image made in God. And more than anything else, we need to present the redeeming power of the cross in our lives and as we talk to our world. This is how we address these things. And I'm going to stop there. We have an invitation song now that Larry's going to lead for us. And uh, if you need to respond right now to the invitation, you have that, that opportunity. So if you have a need, won't you come as we stand together and as we sing. The Lamb was slain, and His blood was poured out, put on the frame for those in that house, now safe inside. As the angel passed them by, like them I cried, cover me with the blood of your forgiveness from the river of your holiness that flows with love. Cover me, the accuser standing o'er me, his power. church. I'm going to start this morning in the book of Psalms, the 107th chapter. <clears throat> Psalms 107, 1 and 2 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mer mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. David here is challenging his nation, of whom he is king, to return to the Lord and give them praise for deliverance from their enemies. 
It's interesting, Chris talked about uh, this morning how we're all broken. We all recognize that David was not without sin. And yet he always found himself returning to the Lord. And it seems as though the history of the Israel nation was this. That they seemed to forget God and choose uh, when things were good. Other idols in their life, other things that were more important to them than their relationship with their creator. We do the same thing today at times. I know I do. If you read ahead then on to uh, in the same chapter into verse 19. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distress. He sent his word and healed them. He sent his word and healed them. Over in the Gospel of John, we see in chapter 1 and verse 13, um, excuse me, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In this God-man, Jesus Christ, our Savior. If you read in, in John, you read about John the Baptist. Generations later, doing the same thing that David did in Psalms. Crying out to his nation to return. To seek God's favor. It seems as though the history of man is in forgetting our place. What's incredibly amazing about all of this to me is that God continues to care for us and love us and save us anyway. This morning, as we partake of the communion feast with our Lord... Because He is here with us now. Think about what's important in your life. We all have sin. God sent Jesus because He knew we could not be what we should be. And all He asks is that we do our best to willingly, every day, turn our life over to Him. Accepting Christ is not something that we do once and it's over. It's a daily sacrifice of what we want, our desires, for what God wants. In 1 Corinthians 11, as well as in all the Gospels, we're told to do this in remembrance of Him. This morning, I'm challenging each one of you, as your brother in Christ, to do this in remembrance of Jesus. As, we set, as, as you sit in those pews and partake of this bread and of this cup, sacrifice this morning the things that you may want and, and remember Jesus, our Savior. Would you pray with me? God Almighty, we come before your throne this morning so very thankful that you loved us enough to give up a piece of yourself so that we might be redeemed. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We ask as we partake of this bread representing his body that hung suspended on the cross between heaven and earth for us and in our place uh, you, that you would bless this loaf and bless each of us as we partake that we might t do it in a way that's uh, pleasing to you and that would be edifying to each of us. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen.
Let's pray again. Father, we continue our prayer of thanksgiving to you for your son. And at this time, we think of the blood that flowed freely from Jesus down that wooden cross. We're thankful for that blood that you see as each of us uh, that are in Christ. You see that blood instead of our sin. We thank you so much for this gift, Father. Help us to live each day, sacrificing each day to you as he did for us on that day of Calvary. We ask your blessing on this fruit of the vine representing that blood that was shed for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just a couple of things to share with you, and then... uh, We will have a a prayer and then one more little thing. Um, Talking with Judy LaFon this morning, she says that uh, Don is going to go into hospice this week. And uh, so we certainly want to remember Don and Judy uh, in this time. Uh, Tyler Parkridge called me last night. His roommate has been diagnosed with COVID. And so he is, uh, has gotten tested. He doesn't have the results back yet, but he will be uh, quarantining himself uh, for a while as well. And then don't forget to fall back next Sunday. You get an extra hour of sleep. Enjoy it. <laughs> All right, let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we um, are grateful that you have extended your love and your grace and your mercy towards each one of us. That we are the recipients of that grace and that love and that mercy. And that you have given that to us freely. And that what you ask of us is simply that we love you in return and that we love each other. Father, we pray that you will help us to do that. Give us the power to do that through your spirit living in us. This is not something we can do of our own human will, our own determination. We need your divine empowerment to do that. Father, there are many that we know and among us who are struggling with their health, and we want to come to you on their behalf. We do Pray for Don in what may very well be his last uh, weeks on this earth. Uh, We pray for Judy as she cares for him and has concern for him and pray that he will get uh, good care uh, with the hospice people. Father, we pray for uh, Bill Sublette as he uh, recovers from his surgery and as he rehabs. We pray that that will go well for him and that he will uh, not be suffering the pain that he was suffering before. We pray for Lee as he recovers from the fall that he suffered. Uh, Just pray that you will uh, help him to heal quickly and completely. We do pray for uh, Tyler Parkridge uh, that he will uh, avoid the uh, COVID disease and that he will uh, just be able to uh, continue to be healthy. We pray for uh, Belinda Jones's neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Ham, and the, the health problems that they are experiencing now. And we pray that you will be with them and, and give them good health. Father, we pray for uh, Norman John's nephew, Jimmy, uh, in the cancer treatment that he's receiving. We pray that that cancer treatment will be effective and will uh, just bring him back to health. Father, we praise you for uh, Norva's granddaughter and her twins who were delivered uh, and and are all doing well. Uh, We thank you for 
just that answer to prayer that you have given to them. Father, we pray for uh, the Beers family and, and the loss of Glenn. Uh, we know that that is a, a, a great sorrow for them, uh, but we also know that uh, Glenn is uh, with you and, and that he is no longer uh, suffering, and we just pray that you will help them to find comfort in that. And Father, there have been so many others who have lost loved ones in uh, the recent past here, and we pray for each one of those, that you will help them as they, uh, as they mourn and as they uh, just remember their loved ones. Father, we also pray for uh, Kimberly Wrangle, uh, that you will give her guidance and wisdom as she makes uh, decisions about her life, give her protection and provision, and we pray for her father as well, James Cain, uh, as he battles cancer. Father, we want to remember uh, the missions that uh, this congregation is uh, closely associated with. We pray for uh, the work in Ecuador. We pray for the work in Zambia. We pray for the Eastern European Mission and for uh, African Christian College. We pray for all of those who are working uh, overseas as they spread your word to others there. We also pray that you will be with our efforts uh, to reach out to uh, this community. We pray that we can uh, be good neighbors and that we can uh, model your love to those uh, that we come in contact with each day. Father, again, we thank you for your the sacrifice of your son and for the way that we uh, can be confident in our eternal destiny with you because of that sacrifice. We thank you and praise you for Jesus who made that possible and who gave his life and suffered and died for us. We pray in his name. Amen. I want to call Larry up and uh, we have a short little presentation to make. October has been designated as Clergy Appreciation Month, and uh, we'd like to call Chris up. Yes, you have to come all the way from the back. Chris and Beth have been with us, I think, now 11 years, and we do appreciate them every day, but uh, we'd like to present Chris and Beth a small token of our appreciation for their work here at Southside. Uh, Beth is home this morning. Her folks are here. They're watching online. So. Okay. And Thank we, you. And with that, we're dismissed. <laughs>